Hey, Falcons fans. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of NFL Jocks and Pigskins with Tom Pollan and Zozo. I am Dave Holcomb. You're right. It took Zozo two seconds to appear on the show. You asked our uh, your Twitter followers how yeah. long it would take for her to come on. And it was so anybody two- who has two seconds, hey, you, you win the pool this week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, we have a really exciting show today. We're having our first guest ever on on the show. Julian Harden is joining us from Georgia State. He has a YouTube channel called The Cynical Peach, and he'll be here in a few minutes. We're going to talk NFL draft with him, ask him first about the Atlanta Falcons, what they're going to do at number four, or is it possible they trade back as we've been clamoring for the last few weeks? We'll discuss all of that with Julian and then uh, I'm hoping to have a, a real nice breakdown of of at least the top ten. Depends on how much time we spend on each pick, right. but I hope we can cover a lot of the first round with Julian today. Yeah, so do I. Um, there's a lot of questions. We've had another move this week uh, that's going to affect the draft and and how uh, teams kind of approach their their first round uh, with the Carolina Panthers picking up Sam Darnold. So. Uh, it's it's yeah. going to be interesting to see. I've seen mock drafts. I've seen everybody, uh, pretty much any top prospect you want to name, it has been tied to the Falcons at some point <laughs> in, in this uh, uh, mock draft season. One thing I'm going to ask Julian is the, about the report from the AJC, which came out late this week. I sent it to you as well. I saw – well, I it sent you the aggregated story from NBC. Yeah. Which I think AJC went to subscription, so I couldn't read all of – the story from Orlando Ledbetter, but um, the, it's, it was the same breakdown from Mike Florio of NBC Sports right. that uh, there was some um, you know debate between the Falcons GM and the new head coach about what to do at number four, and there was some disagreement there, but apparently they're now on the same page. And I guess before Julian gets here, I'll ask you kind of what your reaction was to that story. I don't think it's a huge deal that the head coach and general manager disagree on, on some things. However, I find it odd that you know, both of these guys were brought in this off season. Right. One of the things they had to have been asked in their interview is what do you want to do with the number four pick? And why would the Falcons hire two guys that were going to disagree? Well, you know, well, for one thing, I would hope that Fontenot had a, a hand in, in making that pick uh, of uh, Arthur Smith. So, um, you know, right. I don't find some disagreement as long as when you go into that draft room uh, and get ready for your first round pick and you're in the war room and everybody's, you know, ready to go. Uh, I think it's important, especially in the first round, that everybody's on the same page with who you want, uh, what trade you are willing to make. And and move forward from there. Um, you know, later on in the draft, I don't think it matters. And I don't think just Zozo just walked by like she doesn't care. I so come on, you're supposed to comment here. But uh, you know, I don't think it it matters later on in the draft whether your coach and, and general manager disagree and they they come up with some uh, um, compromise picks. But yeah, you know, especially when you got number four, you better be on the same page. So, it, and a little bit of discussion really doesn't hurt it either. I don't think you know, look, discuss it, and make your best decision on what you think you could do. So they're on the same page. I'm happy. So as long as they're on the same page now, you you don't think it's that big of a deal. It's just no, kinda... I don't think it's that big of a deal. Okay. And healthy yeah. discussion never hurts anything. Uh, yeah, yeah. Ha- I having agree. having your perceptions challenged never hurts anything. Um, mm-hmm. Occasionally you're wrong, you know. Occasionally I'm wrong, <laughs> yeah, rarely, but um, you know. So it, it never hurts to have a discussion, hear somebody else's perspective, and and then you know come into a an agreement on, on what you want to do. So I'm I'm fine with it. I think it's just kind of weird that it was air that it's public that they disagree. That's that's what's unusual. Um, and we have a comment there. Chris, do you mind putting that back up there? Dr- uh, Obi-Wan Scott says, draft Penny Sewell, if not, find a, a way to get R. Slater. So it looks like 
Obi Wan wants some protection for for Matt Ryan. Uh, and that's the thing. I agree with with Obi Wan. Uh, <laughs> we got another yeah. comment from, from Jerry. Uh, yeah. They should either get Kyle Pitts and continue to develop late round players for the future, or trade back, pick up more assets along with a nice running back or edge if he's there. I, I don't know if I agree with the Kyle Pitts part, but I like the idea of trading back. I've been saying that for a while. Yeah, so do I. You, you get more, you know, you need depth on this team. Um, you do need somebody, and where Obi-Wan comes in, you need somebody who can protect Matt Ryan. He's no good if he's horizontal. Um, you, you need him standing up. You, you need him to be able to – If Kylie Pitts is going to create matchup problems – uh, for defenses against the Falcons. I, I get that, but Matt Ryan has to be standing up long enough to see those matchup problems. Um, yeah. sure. and it was a problem last year. So, you know, Penny Sewell, I've, I've called for before. Uh, there's one other um, offensive tackle kind of hit the – look up his name here – I think it's Slater, right? Rashad Slater. Rashad Slater, yes. You're right. Slater out of Northwestern. Yeah, his yeah. name should be on the tip of my tongue. It, he only plays uh, football about 10, 15 miles from me. So, <laughs> <laughs> But I agree. And, and some would say Rashad Slater is actually technically a better tackle than uh, Sewell is. Yeah. So, you know, Sewell has more – up front, he's coming up, he's stronger, but some say that uh, that Slater is, you know, better, has better technical footwork and, and hands uh, usage that uh, was going to make him a better tackle, at least, you know, coming out of this draft. I've read that as well. Peter Schrager in, in his latest mock draft has Slater going ahead of Sewell. And that's something I want to talk about with Julian, and who is actually here, if, if we can bring him on now, Chris. Chris Smitherman, our producer, of hey. course, for being here with us, Chris. And Julian, thanks for coming on. This is Julian Harden from Georgia, the, the Slate at Georgia State. He has a YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel that everyone should check out called The Cynical Peach. Julian, how are you today? I'm doing great. Uh, ready to get down to uh, Atlanta Falcons uh, draft and how crazy it is right now. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, it's a lot is being discussed about what they could do at, at number four. We've talked about it for weeks on this show. We just were debating it a little bit here to, to open up today. Um, what do you see them doing? And, and then what would you like to see them do? I guess there's kind of two different questions. There. Uh, for one thing, uh, I predict in this draft is that no matter what the Falcons do, the fan base will not be happy in some fashion uh, <laughs> because some people want a quarterback. Some people want only defense. Some people want offense. But ultimately, where I see them doing is I definitely see them trading down. And I think there was a report yesterday about the Washington football team really liking Trey Lance. So I actually see them, you know, throwing everything they can to get Trey Lance and trading and trading with the Falcons. The Redskins get four, get the fourth pick, and the Falcons actually get the nineteenth pick. Uh, uh, with uh, that will be Washington's pick. It's, it will be a massive trade down, but that is a major allocation of resources, draft capital. The Falcons could need to fix a lot of issues on this team, or at least cover a lot of issues on this team. Yeah, that is a big trade down. So yeah. What, yeah. what would it, what would it trade take down. for for Washington to um, make that kind of move up? What would so Atlanta get? Yeah, so I have Atlanta getting the uh, get a 19th pick, which is their first round pick. The their second round pick, which is 51st. Their 74th uh, pick, the third round, 124th, uh, which is their fourth, and a 2022 first. You know, it's a huge trade up. But if Washington wants Trey Lance as much as you know the reports say he does, and Ron Rivera really likes a guy, uh, a developmental guy that he could really you know, stick his name to, especially in Washington, kind of remake this whole offense as he wants to, then they may be willing to swing for the fences. I mean, the NFC East isn't a really hard division to win, and he sees how vulnerable it is, so he thinks, like, why not? I could definitely have a quarterback I can mold and still win his division, even while only winning, like, seven to eight games. Well, he won it last year, and, yeah. and uh, 
you know, with the plug and play quarterback situation. So, so why not? Definitely. So I can see Robert Barry saying that, okay, let's do this. And he wants to have a new culture there in Washington, obviously. So having a new guy in Trey Lance would definitely do that. And I think for the Falcons, I mean, for being honest here, the Falcons could use more picks. Um, and the fact is they have so many issues on this team. Not one pick in the first round is going to solve that, no matter how many fans right. think it will. Right, exactly. There's there's more holes on this team than some fans are willing to admit. And, yeah. And, and right, and Dave and I have been talking about depth, and that that's how you build depth. You you've mm-hmm. got to accumulate picks, and uh, you know work from there. There's still going to be it. To me, it seems like it's a very strong draft, and there's going to be some solid prospects as as you go down you're still going to be able to get some difference makers on your team. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, with that pick, Falcons do trade all the way down to 19. I can see them addressing their secondary, which was absolutely decimated uh, throughout the season. I mean, especially we saw the collapse, especially that Dallas game where, you know, the, the just seeing Dallas could do anything. To, you know, they could throw anything over five yards and it would end up being a huge net game, uh, net yeah. game on the ground uh, through the air. And so I have him getting Caleb Farley out of Virginia Tech, one of the top-rated cornerbacks in this draft. It's just that with the Falcons, you know, the Falcons, if they could, I'm sure a lot of people want them to get Kyle Pitts or another offensive weapon. But all I can see there is the Falcons probably score 40 points and then they'll allow 50 points. Right. Um, So (laughs) they definitely need that upgrade. And considering how well, um, how well, uh, you know, our, our, some some of our young guys played last last season. I think that you could see the progression from them. And, you know, adding someone with talent like Caleb Farley could really help this secondary. And, you know, you know, Dean Pease's defense, we'll, we can see how that will work in, uh, in in his system. But, yeah, I feel like if they straight down, I think secondary is the way to go, especially with Sertan off the board. Uh, in, yeah, he'll in, definitely in be off the board, right. Yeah, I definitely don't see him being at 19. Um, you so you think maybe pairing somebody up with AJ Terrell is going to be a, a positive yeah, for the Falcons? Definitely, and having Dean Pease there, uh, I think it's going to be a it's going to be a major fit basis for the defense. Now, I don't think it'll be top ten or anything, but I think the striving factor for the Falcons defense should be at least maybe sitting in the top fifteen. I mean, maybe near the top fifteen, they can. I have I don't have high expectations, but in the better than last year. <laughs> Which isn't asking much, but if uh, the Falcons have won the worst secondaries uh, last season, and so an upgrade for the secondary is badly needed. Yeah, I had. Can... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead, Tom. Do you make a point about the secondary? Yeah, I had uh, the Falcons 26th in creating negative pass plays last year, uh, with sacks and interceptions. So they're not getting a lot of pressure. They're not forcing. Uh, bad throws from quarterbacks. They're not getting to the quarterback in six. Uh, mm. 27th, they were, um, let's see, where is it? Defensive passer rating, they were also 27th. They're giving up 101.7 passer rating per game. Yeah. That's over 17 weeks. You know, that's, it, yeah. It, you so as much as fans want to play Matt Ryan and everything, I mean, you try to play with that defense. I mean, I will be excited for if any team lashes the face of the Falcons. Like, okay, awesome. I'm going to get at least 20, 25 points out of this secondary. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah. So I definitely think, especially since the the defensive line class isn't that deep in this draft uh, on paper. So you definitely want to grab one of the top corners in this draft. And, you know, Caleb, and uh, I think with, you know, Caleb Farley, that is the way to go uh, with a talented young, uh, young player at Virginia Tech. Um, I had a question, just a general draft question that, that has occurred to me over the last couple of days. Uh, in 2020, we had a lot of players opt out of the season because of COVID-19 hmm. um, that are entering this year's draft. Do you think there's going to be a big difference between the players who opted out and are still coming into the league now uh, between them and the players who did uh, see the field in 2020? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I definitely think that, you know, we have like Serena Pinesuo who opted out for this season. 
and yet he's still thought as seen as a top uh, a, one a generational pick on you know for the offensive line. I think there's definitely going to be a difference because I mean we saw with other sports the fact that you know it's going to be harder for these rookies to acclimate to you know to uh, to getting back to playing day. So I think there's going to be a difference. However, especially with you know hopefully we have normal training camp by the time this rolls around that I think that you're going to see a major, uh, major, major difference. So I, I think that there's going to be some extra growing pains, uh, not, not playing that long, but I think you're, I think you're going to see a, them be able to return to uh, be able to get to a place where they're practicing normally and not having major disruptions, especially uh, looking at how things are with COVID-19 uh, currently. So basically, they're still prospects. I mean, they're, they're still yeah. – it, it really it doesn't hurt uh, their potential as they come into the NFL, is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, so – I, yeah, I, I wanted to no, ask, uh, return to the number four pick and other trade possibilities, but Chris says that we have a question from a fan, a listener. Andre Johnson says, will Jace Horn be available at number 19? Uh, so Jace Horn's an interesting prospect, uh, and I think that for Dean Pease's uh, defense, I, I had him actually uh, going a little bit earlier, um, just because I know that cornerback is going to be a major need, uh, major need, especially more now than ever, considering that so many quarterbacks are being able to scrap out of the pocket and being able to make throws on the run. I think quarterbacks, cornerbacks, going to be a premium, so I had him going a bit earlier. I just think that with Dean Pease's defense, that someone like Farley would be able to fit uh, fit better. But that's probably the best the Falcons can get at that at that time at nineteen. Uh, but I think any way the Falcons go, cornerback or any secondary is going to be a big part of, or should be a significant driving factor to choose, um, especially going later later in the first round. But if it wasn't if it wasn't uh, Farley, uh, Warren would have been definitely a strong choice to go uh, to go for the Falcons at nineteen. Okay. Peter uh, Schrager has the New England Patriots trading up to number four in his latest mock draft with the with the the Falcons. Do you see that as a, a possibility? And and what other teams could potentially trade up to four other than the Washington football team in your mind? Well, New England will be interesting because they've never been in this position before. We've never had, I mean, yeah. at least in my lifetime. So I've never had to see like, oh, New England trading up. Oh, that would never happen. So, but. You know, I think New England is in an interesting position. I mean, they have Cam Newton, but obviously we've seen due to injuries. Cam Newton is not going to be the Cam Newton that tore us to shreds in 2015 and created so many issues for us. So yeah. I definitely think it's a possibility. I definitely wouldn't out uh, rule it out. I think a bigger possibility would probably be Chicago. I mean, Chicago is – they have Eddie Dalton, and he's slated to be QB1. But if you're Chicago, you're probably thinking that Eddie Dalton is not going to be my future. No, I mean, no, he just he's can't. Be. He's a good quarterback, but that's not who I'm going to build my team around. No. Um. So I think Chicago's a major possibility. That I think people aren't really paying attention, uh, paying attention to. So I can see that happening. I think I will tell you that people in Chicago are paying attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm yeah, in definitely. Chicago. If you, if you didn't know, Joel. yeah. Another possibility see, I could see yeah. um, is Denver. Denver's at nine, and I, I agree with you. Yeah, Denver's at nine, and so it wouldn't be that big of a jump for them to get to four. I know that some other mock draft people were saying Carolina, but there is no chance I could. I, I know they made the trade with Sam Darlin, but right. no, the Atlanta is not going to trade the team they're going to see twice a season and possibly into the playoffs and want to give them like imagine giving them Trey Lance and him kicking your butt for you know two times, maybe three <laughs> times in the season. No, that's not that's not happening. But yeah. Denver and Chicago. I will put them as more likely as the Patriots, but that's just, again my bias since Belichick just never seems like a guy that wants to like trade so far up sixteen picks to, uh, over sixteen picks to get no. uh, number four number four guy. He never has, but I think the Patriots have the most draft capital to give up if they want to move up to number four. Uh, yeah. They have the most to give the Falcons if, if they decide that they want to make that move. They do. He's and I think never had to do that. You know, we're saying he's never done it before, but he's never had to be aggressive like that. Tom Brady, right. Exactly. Yeah, he's yeah. always Tom been Brady's plugging in world. around his quarterback. Right. He's never actually had to, to plug in the guy, uh, at least for the last, what, 15 years or so? 
Yeah. Yeah. It, it's such an interesting because we never seen and added to the list of weird things that happened in 2020. So, you know, the fact that, you know, the Patriots were struggling at quarterback, we have never, we've never seen that before. And I think it does add to the intrigue, the fact that they could possibly trade up. I just think that Chicago and Denver are much stronger candidates because, you know, they have quarterbacks, but they're not quarterbacks. You think like, yeah, I want full control on going forward or uh, going forward. So, I definitely think that's a stronger possibility uh, for a trade up for the Falcons. And if the Bonsar Bears this greatly, if the Bears had the defense that they had two years ago, I would say Dalton would be a guy who they might be able to win with. Definitely. But no, right now, yeah, you have to be really looking hard at that number four pick. Uh, and I, I think the Bears are Bears and Denver are definitely going to make a play for it. Yeah. And I guess what the Washington pick is that I just find it most intriguing because Ron Rivera, you know, he's really aggressive about changing that culture, really yes, changing yes. the way we think about the Washington football team. And we saw how good they were, even though they didn't win uh, very much for division winner. They played well against the uh, against Tampa Bay in that first round playoff game. You know, uh, you know, we saw Tyler Heineke really develop, but I can really see him wanting that quarterback he wants to draft. The first time he's really had a guy to draft since the Panthers drafted Cam Newton in 2011. Right. So having that ability to get your guy, be Trey Lance, and Trey Lance is going to be a project, but I can see him that being a project that Ron Rivera really wants to work with into the future. And they have Ryan Fitzpatrick, at least for the short term. Oh, yeah, of course. And he always right. comes in and has Fitz magic, so of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll put the people in the seats, that's for sure. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess going forward for that for the trade uh, for the second round for the Falcons, you know, Richard thirty fifth pick, I actually have them picking up Javante Williams out of North Carolina. You think he's you know, still going to be around then? I think there's a possibility. I think because we do have Najee Harris, which I really think is going to go in the latter half of the first round, and then ETN following that, either probably in the last few picks or in the first one to go in the second round. So I think that definitely leaves Javante Williams for the Falcons. Devontae Devante Williams to me is the guy to get at running back. Yeah, and I, 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 th I think if the Falcons can get him, if they can get him in the second round, they're doing yeah. a heck of a and, job there. And I can't stress this enough because I, I feel like a lot of people in Atlanta kind of downplay how badly we need a running back, uh, you know, a constant run, a threat at running back because the Falcons pass the ball a lot, but. When it comes to situations where you got to have a guy, you know, run the clock out, we don't have that. We haven't That's had that it. relationship with Michael Turner. And, and even Jaquiz Rogers did well. So, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have that threat at running back. We thought Todd Gurley would be the answer, and he wasn't. Freeman fizzled out uh, out of Shanahan's system. And so we haven't had that guy to say, okay, I'm, we're going to take – we're going to give him the ball. We're going to pound it, you know, for for the last half of the, of the second half. We're going to make sure we don't lose his lead because – Matt Ryan throwing the ball constantly, like that's not that's predictable. Every defense can say, okay, Matt Ryan's gonna throw the ball. Right. Like, let's see, Julio, you got Ridley. We know we gotta worry about these guys but on the ground. You don't have to worry about anything. Don't have to worry about anything. So you, you, can, you can keep a four man box and have seven men in your secondary and and you're making life really difficult for, for Matt Ryan that way. Uh you exactly. gotta have you gotta have somebody who's gonna bring the keep the linebackers home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody that a safety is going to have to look at instead of, you know, letting them sit back in coverage all day. Exactly. And, you know, this uh, and the, we still I feel like many Falcons fans like to cling to the belief that we still have an offense as powerful as the 2016 one or 2018, <laughs> which we definitely don't like we can pass and get a lot of yards. But like Freeman and Coleman were the unsung heroes of that. Yes, of that they offense. were. So, they certainly you know, were. Not having those, not having that kind of offense, uh, you know, not, ha not having that part of the offense is a major loss. And this team will not go anywhere with just a pass happy offense. And okay. having Dirk Cutter, you know, the last couple of years has is completely ruined the rhythm on offense. And so, yeah, this has to be a, a, a not just a defensive draft, but you got to have you got to address both sides of the ball. And they really need to address this running back, uh, running back position. Uh, you need someone who can start, who can, you know. Because I know we signed Mike Davis, but you need that you need that youth. Uh, and I know we have Brian Hill. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to see from him since that isn't uh, Arthur Smith's Arthur Smith's guy. So I'm interested to see what you see out of him. But I'm pretty sure he's going to look for what guy can I get that 
uh, what guy can I get the uh, can I get that may become a thousand yard rusher someday? Not a Derrick Henry because that's <laughs> that's that would be amazing, but that's probably not going to happen. But someone who can give me a thousand yards, someone who can take the pressure of Matt Ryan in the passing game, mm-hmm. and really just make this offense more explosive because you know on the ground, like I said before, this team is just not a threat on the ground at all. No, they yeah, and it's sad to see, honestly, this kind of fall the offense. I agree. You Go brought ahead. up Penny Sewell earlier, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about the offensive linemen. We were talking about uh, Slater as well before you jumped on, the tackle from Northwestern. Um, Penny Sewell, I've been seeing, has been falling in some mock drafts. Now, yeah. you know, Tom is the king of telling me that mock drafts don't mean anything. <laughs> um, What's your take on on Sewell? Is there a reason why he's dropping, and is he actually dropping? You know, in 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 the minds of the GMs, I don't think he's dropping. Part of it, I think a lot of it is smoke and the fact that you know the 49ers trading up really changed everything about how we're looking at the draft. So with the 49ers trading up, you're like, okay, it's going to be the first thing going to be quarterbacks, and yes. the Falcons are going to be that first team's going to be like, well, we don't really know. It's right. like. It probably causes Slater, I mean, not Slater, but uh, Slater and P.J. Sue to drop down a bit. But the fact is, the Bengals really want to improve the offensive line. It's no yes. secret. Um, yeah. As good as Burrow played, as well as he played, he's he's getting lit up. He's getting lit up constantly. I mean, yes. and for the as much as, as attractive as someone like Jamar Chase would be to the Bengals, it's not going to be that great if your quarterback's on the ground again right? Uh, and you're wasting him. So the Bengals would definitely need someone like P.J. Sue and the Falcons, if they if they stayed at four, could definitely use Pene Suwo. So I don't think he's dropping at all. I just think that 49ers trading up has kind of made a lot of uh, people uh, on the inside more more think about like, okay, is there going to be a chance to be more quarterbacks drafted? You know, and the Falcons being that weird hangup, it's just kind of changing the trajectory of how people see Pene Suwo. I mean, I think he's going to be good wherever he goes to, but he's I definitely don't see him. Uh, because I heard I seen him as low as eleventh, and I'm like, there is no way he's dropping to eleventh in the draft. I, I just think the 49ers yeah. trade has got everyone a little bit off their heels about where Sewell's going to go. But I will be surprised if he drops out like the top five or the top six, uh, especially past the Bengals, because they the Bengals need uh, someone like Pene Sewell. Yeah, I, oh, I yes, completely I do. agree. Completely agree. Uh, I. I but Todd McShay, I believe, has Sewell falling to 13, which is really unbelievable. Um, yeah. I, and the you brought up Jamar Chase. Jamar Chase to the Bengals, even though they need an offensive lineman, has really been been heating up as well. Yeah, Jamar Chase is, and I feel that's coming off the uh, coming off the heels. It's just that the Bengals' offense, when it was dynamic, it was explosive last season. Uh, they play well against the Browns. They play well against really good competition, but. You know, yeah. that's more – I feel like it's more style over substance. Your quarterback tore his ACL last season, so your quarterback's going to need that protection. So if he slips past the Bengals, I'll, I'll really – for one, I'll be shocked. And two, I'll be questioning, like, questioning the Bengals, like, do you want butts and seats or do you want your quarterback to be upright? I would personally take my 24-year-old quarterback who needs to be upright uh, than, having yeah. a, than having a really good receiving prospect in Jafar Chase, which, don't get me wrong, will be – should be a really good player in the NFL, but you know priorities. The Bengals need help on the offensive line, and I get it, it's yeah. more than one round. But if you're going to pick the best player available, and you know address your need too, who well is the way to go for the uh, for Cincinnati Bengals? And to me, that's not even a debate. I agree with you, um, and I've always been a proponent. You build from the inside out. You yeah, know, you get your lines and set up, and and you there's a lot you can do with that team. If, mm-hmm. if you have offensive and defensive fronts uh, ready to go. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. That, it, that's a no-brainer for them to, to get a Sewell. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Tristan West. I like offensive guard David Moore from Grambling. Offensive, uh, I think. Center. Does he mean center offensive coordinator? Quinn Mineris from Wisconsin White Whitewater. And the tackle – Man, um, pronunciation is not one of my strong suits. That <laughs> player from Buffalo has good fits in later rounds for us. These guys are hungry and would fit well. I'm telling yeah. you, Tristan's really doing some deep diving as far as uh, his scouting goes. Yeah, yeah. I love uh, Moore will be 
I, I've seen I have uh, friends who go to Grambling and talk all the time about more. So that I would love if the Falcons were to pick up uh, more. I mean, really, really good prospect. He'd be developmental, but someone you could plug in in the long term and have because Smith prides himself on the offensive line. That's why he had such a great offense in Tennessee. So that's why I'm really excited about the Falcons overall because they can go in so many different directions with this offense. And, you know, they could draft, like, in the, if they don't trade for, they could draft someone like Pitts. But if they want to stay with the offensive line route, it wouldn't be sexy. But, you know, get a guy, develop, get a developmental guy by like, more in the fifth or sixth round. And then you have someone like Pene Suo. I mean, you have the makings of probably protecting Matt Ryan for the at least two year, two more seasons that you have him here, mm -hmm. which I definitely think that uh, we're going to see. And I just have a question for you guys. Uh, do you guys think that uh, like there was a rumor about Fontenot, uh, Fontenot uh, wanting, wanting Trey Lance and uh, Smith believing that there, Ryan had a couple more years left and he really wants pits? Which yeah. would you guys prefer? Because I'd be fine with either one of them because you, you solve long term with uh, Ryan if he doesn't you know play well the next two years. But if you get pits, I mean, imagine that offense. Yeah, my – uh, my thought on Pitts, though, is Ryan has to be uh, vertical to be able to see him, to be able to see the mis mismatches. You know, if Ryan's running for his life or, or getting dragged down be before he can scan the field and see what's happening, uh, Pitts doesn't do much for you. And this is still a team with a strong passing game. Uh, I, I think I I've said before, I think Pitts is going to be a great player. He would be a great player for the Falcons if they took him. Um, but he's not the guy that they need at number four. And I don't like taking pass catchers that high. And that's what he is. He's a pass catching tight end. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, I, I pretty much agree with all that. That He's a dynamic player. He would be – we talk a lot of fantasy on this show. Julian, he would be fantastic fantasy tight end right away for dynasty owners and even as a rookie in redraft leagues. But that's not what the Falcons – it's not a need and it's not necessarily a great spot to take a pass catcher, as Tom said. So, yeah, at, at four in particular, I, I think is too high for Pitts for the Falcons. Yeah, I just I could see if the Falcons were to stay at four. I feel like the likely the most likely options would be either Lance or Pitts. And you know, you know, the Falcons haven't have struggled in the red zone, so it will make sense for Arthur Smith's percent yeah. uh He runs these two tight end sets. He used them to great effect in Tennessee, and he had he, he would have a more experienced quarterback in Matt Ryan and some more dynamic weapons in Atlanta and you know, every time the Falcons have gone for gone far in the playoffs, they usually have an athletic tight end, whether it was Tony Gonzalez in his later years or Austin Hooper in the Super Bowl, which I still can't watch, by the way. Um, <laughs> I would never watch that. I would never watch that game again. <laughs> um, he usually has an athletic tight end to throw to, but you're right, offensive line. The bet again, the best years he had a great offensive line. I just wish at the end of the day that this. This uh this class had deeper pass uh, pass rushers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because that's you're not winning anything with Dexter Fowler, which I'm not surprised about. Inconsistent and uh, what he had like three sacks this se this season. Um, it was low. Yeah. yeah. It's um, disappointing. Yeah, I, so I'm glad you're transitioning us to defense because I I wanted to ask you about you know who. We were discussing last week or the week before that we couldn't really decide who the best defensive player is in this draft. And then we went to the experts and NFL.com basically had an article where four different, five different analysts had three or four different names. They couldn't decide either. So who do you think is the best defensive player in this draft? Uh, yeah, it's because unlike in other drafts, you don't have a Chase Young. You don't. Right. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no Nick Bosa. No There's no Nick Bosa. Yes. You know, so if the Falcons had went 4-12 and 12 last season, you would have had a shot at someone like the talent of Chase Young, which you thought was the standout player. And if it wasn't for Burrow, probably would have gone number one. But yeah. you, you don't you don't have that. You don't have that here. Now, for the and, Falcons, I'm just, I'm just looking at the Falcons. You know, maybe you could – maybe uh, the best player for them might be a guy uh, 
uh, might be maybe a guy like uh, Carlos ba uh, Basham out of Wake Forest. He's a defensive end, can really eat up space. I think for them, that might be the best choice uh, for the defensive line for them. So, I, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, players, I think a lot of people are really banking on uh, Gregory Rousseau out of Miami as the best as the best uh, defensive player. Although he, he didn't. I've seen some weaknesses there too, though. So Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people who point out similarities to Vic Beasley or Tat McKinley, which immediately <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, now that again. Um, right. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> which I, I would be very concerned about. Uh, but to me, I know this might be a cop out, but there is not really a best player. You have maybe a guys who can do a ton of good things, but not particularly dominant on any one of them. So, you know, it, it's one of those rare, rare drafts. And you're like, if the Falcons maybe we had the same record last year, you're probably walking out with a lot better. Like, you, you know, you had CJ Henderson last year. You had, as we said, you had uh, Chase Young last year, who was standard mm -hmm. defensive players. You don't have that here. So, you know, I think that if the Falcons, you're probably looking at a guy like Basham, who, again, has a lot of things to work on. But for you, right. it's probably a great piece going forward to fix that or not fix, but at least put a band-aid on that defense, which seems to be a never ending project. It's the Mike Smith era for some reason. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so I get I mean, that kind of answers my question. Why? so many analysts can't really decide who the best defensive player is because uh, there really is no consensus. Mad Mike Sports says, Julian, I'm convinced this is you. Hey, so Mike. <laughs> yeah, I know Mike real well. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so we- do you, make it, do you think it makes it harder for the Falcons to trade considering that there's no edge rusher or nobody dominant on defense that a, t a team is going to trade up for? Yeah, I think since this quarter, uh, since this draft is going to be quarter, uh, more focused on the quarterbacks and with it likely being someone like, you know, Trevor Lawrence, and then after that you have Zach Wilson and then just being a crapshoot after that. Yes. I think a lot of teams are going to bypass the defense. Say, if I can get my quarterback of the future, maybe with that fourth pick, then I'm willing to make, I'm willing to make that jump. Um, I think that's – I think – that's probably going to be the, the saving thing for the Falcons at four. Now, whether they trade what they do in the layer drafts, I'm not sure. That will probably be a big, uh, bigger indicator who, who was left on defense. And so I don't see them, a team making a big jump, say they want to trade with the Falcons in the third or fourth round. They're not going to give a lot of future picks for that because it's like, I'm probably working with a project for the next few years. I'm, I may give you an yeah. extra fourth or fifth down the line, but, I'm not going to give you a big. Uh, I'm not going to give you a big package in the in the in the mid tier rounds. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think it it may have some difficulties, but I don't think that you're going to see a uh, major a major issue for the Falcons considering that I'm pretty sure they've gotten calls uh, and will get calls leading up to their uh, their time being announced on the NFL draft because it really is where the draft starts. Obviously, Trevor Lawrence is going to the Jaguars. They try to play off as a big thing. We all know what's going to happen. Zach Wilson would probably be the guy for the Jets. Uh, and the third pick is where either you have Justin Fields from Ohio State or Mac Jones, who's suddenly risen up draft boards. Yeah, and he's it, been compared to Matt Ryan for some odd reason. He, he's, um, he's firing up the draft boards. It's amazing to see. For somebody who hasn't played football in two months, it's, it's amazing to see how far he's risen. Yeah, and I want to and I want to ask you guys this. I've seen a lot of big sports commentators comparing uh, for Mac Jones, his pro comparison being Matt Ryan, and I'm like, that's not to me. That's not really fair. I mean, playing in Boston College while yeah, being a P five T or school, it's not the same as having Alabama having career guys who are like you know who are constantly having you know top picks every season. I I, just, I thought it was a horrible comparison. Uh, but w what yeah. do you guys think? Because I thought the Mac, I thought that was kind of disrespectful to compare, you know, his pro comp to be Matt Ryan, as if Matt Ryan's his second tier or third tier quarterback. I understand no. what analysts are trying to do with those player comps, but they end up just sounding really silly. I think a lot of times because you know, people take that as Mac Jones is going to turn into Matt Ryan, and that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is his playing style is like him, but. Uh, 
but yeah, I don't, I, I honestly, I didn't watch Mac Jones enough to really know if it's, if he does play like Matt Ryan, but um, I think your point is well taken. And we saw it with Tua last year, not that I'm giving up on Tua yet, but mm -hmm. Tua does not look like a top five pick if we're redoing last year's draft as he was, you know, last year. Was he was he number six last year? So um, maybe that's a product of him benefiting from the Alabama system. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think the tank for Tua thing, as soon as Deshaun Watson was rumored to be on uh, the training block, which we still don't know, uh, that all of a sudden was like, okay, Miami becomes a destination for Tua. I mean, for uh, Deshaun Watson, and Tua may be on on his way out. So I was, right. I was like, you know, for a guy you said tank for Tua, all of a sudden now it's like, okay, how do we get rid of Tua uh, if the if the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the time arises? So well, yeah, it be the first quarterback to have that happen to him. So. No, it wouldn't. I'm just saying for all the tank for Tua memes, which I really enjoyed. Um, <laughs> it, it will be a very anticlimactic way to end that whole tenure. The whole build up tank for Tua finally happens, and oh yeah, he's gone after a season because we got Deshaun Watson. Right, right. Yeah, that would be that would be very ironic. We got another comment from West. Lots of players here: Mika Parsons, Trevor Mooring, Eric Stokes, Andre Cisco, Aline McNeil, Tyler Chevrolet will all be beasts on defense. Do you uh, yeah. you agree, Julian? Yeah, Michael, and I'm, I don't know why Michael Parsons escaped my name the first uh, escaped my mind the first time, but the issue is like it's more of need. Do the Falcons really need? If you look at Dimitrov's tenure, he did draft linebackers pretty well. Um, so, yes, I would. That's the only thing about Michael Parsons. The Falcons had a dire need at linebacker. I would definitely look at uh, drafting, getting a guy like a uh, uh, like Michael Parsons, but. You know, for right now, they don't feel like they they uh they need they need uh, the linebacker position, and you know, Deion Jones he struggled early in the season like most of the defense did, but he came on strong I think in the latter half of the season, and mm -hmm. he's on contract. So I don't, Michael Parsons would be a great addition. I just don't think the Falcons necessarily would look to get him, considering that if we're going look at a need, we talk about would Kyle Pitts be more of a need or best player available. He could probably ask the same thing for Micah Parsons for the Falcons. Yeah. What, is that is that really a need? Is that best player available? And even if you draft him, when does he start or where right. does he start? Uh, we haven't really seen Dean Pease's what he's going to do for that defense. So it would be a mixed bag. I wouldn't be I, I wouldn't be angry if they got him. I would just be more of like, so is he? Where are you going to play him? What does it do for Deion Jones? I mean, I, I'd be right. interested to see what happened, but you know. That's nothing against Michael Parsons, great player. Um, I know there are some uh, some people talking about his character, um, character clause. I've uh, seen a couple a while of ago. Things, yeah. I, Arthur Blank usually doesn't like to draft players that have character flaws. He usually likes to stay away from that. And the Falcons usually like to stay away from that as a team. They don't like the drama. Uh, but Michael Parsons would be a great uh, I, Michael Parsons would be a great uh, a great player to have. I just don't know for the Falcons. Uh, what what place he would be on the Falcons per se? No, and I think uh, you know with the Luakon out there too. You know, you, you, oh you're yeah, fairly definitely. good. A Luakon is one of the best linebackers in the league. Nobody talks about. So um, yeah, you know, with him and and Jones out there, I don't think that's the biggest need. I mean, it would be an impact player, but uh, I think the Falcons could get impact players, uh, quality players at number four. Uh, that would still be worth the number four pick if they don't take Micah Parsons, if they go somewhere else with that pick. Mm -hmm. We had a comment from Gremlin. Chris, do you mind putting that back up on our screen? Jones' football IQ is off the charts, and that is what is attracting Shanahan to hit him one year and learn it. I got a follow-up question for you, for you, Julian, based on that comment. Do you see Mac Jones sitting out? his rookie season. We really don't see that from quarterbacks anymore. I mean, Tua sat out two months and that was a huge deal. Uh, Jared Goff sat out a few years ago. Now he sat out two months and again, everyone was clamoring. Why, like, what's wrong with Jared Goff? Why isn't he the starter? I, well, that was Jeff Fisher as head coach too. Yeah. That's the only <laughs> one I talked about. Yeah. So Derek, uh, so Fisher was the coach and Mr. I'm not going seven and nine 
or eight and eights. Well, he went four and twelve. So, or right. congratulations. So, no. it, I, I'm the thing is with the 49ers is that you traded all the way to get this pick. You know, you have conversations with multiple teams to say, okay, and you were in Shanahan, and apparently the sources are saying Shanahan basically said, how far, how far up can we go? Can we go for? Can we can we go up to three? And the only team that said that we don't want to discuss were the Jets, and so they trade up to three. Say if you pick a Mac Jones with the third pick, sitting him after you traded all those picks, it's like okay. So if you trade for this guy, all these picks you give away mothers, uh, you give away ransom. Why are you sitting him for a year? Yeah. So uh, like for a yeah. from a PR from a PR standpoint, it's like. What was the point of that? I mean, like you could have gotten him if you, you didn't have to do this. If you were going to send him out for a year, you there's a possibility you could have gotten him without trading up or trading up to three for that matter. Right. So right. it doesn't make much sense, especially from a PR standpoint to your fans to say, yeah, we trade up. We trade. We get our, uh, our first, second, and I think third round pick for next year. Oh, but we're going to send this guy for a year have him develop. No, I, I don't see San Francisco fans saying, oh, yeah, I'm totally okay with that. Like, no, I'm not okay with that. Like, if you trade up for this guy, I want him to start day one. So, yeah. Uh, if he Now, if he doesn't win the quarterback job with Garoppolo, that's another problem because then you're saying, again, you trade up for this guy who couldn't beat Garoppolo. So yeah, I don't even know if Garoppolo is going to be there by the start of the season. I mean, San Francisco has been saying all the right things about Garoppolo, but that doesn't actually mean anything. Um, so, so we'll see. I don't think – I I think the 49ers still moved up to number three. I agree with you. I think you got it uh, nailed, Julian. They they went up there for a starter, and I think they'll get their starter. And uh, it's it's not going to be Garoppolo. Garoppolo is going to be somewhere else before the season starts. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I did, about uh, the the rest of the NFC South before uh, we wrap up here. Um, hmm especially Carolina, you brought up them trading for Sam Darnold. So they're kind of out of the quarterback market, at least for now, they have really two backup quarterbacks and one of them is going to start. Um, so where do you see Carolina going with their pick? And then if you, if you can give us kind of a, a lowdown on what the Saints and Buccaneers might do. Yeah. So the, I remember the, when the, when the Panthers trade for Darnold, especially you know we live in Falcons fan bases, I remember people laughing like, "Oh, great!" So you know we got to, we got to compete with Teddy and Sam Darnold. What a joke! <laughs> so uh, I, the only thing that said to me was that the the Panthers were like, "Okay, we're definitely not trading with the Falcons because they're probably saying no, probably telling us to f off or something like that." Since we're division rivals, um, so I, I think Carolina's interesting. Um, it, 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 they drafted all defense last year. They drafted Derek Brown. <laughs> Uh, they right, yeah. drafted uh, who I really, who I'm an Auburn fan, so I love Derek Brown. I really want to be with the Falcons, but unfortunately not. Um, they have so many interesting pieces that they could, they could go with, but Carolina is an interesting thing. I don't think that they're you – know, a lot of people are pensive in his last place, which, again, I, I would, I'd be careful with that, considering that they could easily play a spoiler team. I mean, they they could easily be that team that, sneak, that sneaks up and maybe wins – you know, seven to nine games by accident mm-hmm. and ends up getting into that last wild card. You know, they they have a lot of rookies, but they also a lot of uh, guys who were rookies last season who are coming. But mm-hmm. I, I would I would be cautious picking the uh, picking the Panthers being last place. I think they could be a sneaky good team. Like Christian McCaffrey, if he's healthy, you yeah. know, you don't it's need a dynamic quarterback yeah. to you know give him to you know give him passes to get him to the end zone. He could do that on his yeah. own. Um, the Panthers were aggressive this offseason. They tried to trade for Deshaun Watson. Uh, but I, I would be cautious about putting the Panthers as the last place team in this division and not making any noise. Do I think they're good enough to win a division? No. Uh, but to say that they're not on a – they couldn't compete with the Falcons or the Saints who are trying to kind of reconfigure without Drew Brees – I think yeah. that would be I think that would be misguided considering that they're not there's not that much of a gap between the Bucks, the Falcons, or the Saints without Drew Brees. I don't think there is. I think the only gap is between the Buccaneers and the rest of the division. Okay. Okay. Um how much longer do you think Tom Brady has? 
I mean, oh boy, yeah, you know, this is a guy. <laughs> normally, most quarterbacks who get to that age oh, uh, and, and still try to play are finished. Uh, he he's the oldest quarterback to not only have a winning record but also win a Super Bowl. So, uh, you know, before him, Brett Favre was the the winningest oldest quarterback at age forty one. So, you know. I, I keep wondering. I keep expecting to see this this downturn from Brady, and we never see it. You, you know, at this point, I think someone told uh, one of my friends made a joke saying that they think that uh, Brady will win three Super Bowls with the Falcons, even make their next Super Bowl. <laughs> um, I just the thing is, is that Brady went to a perfect went to a perfect team in the Buccaneers. I, I think that you know people talk about it, they mention it, but like the Bucks have. A great defense with Shaq Barrett, uh, with Shaq Barrett on the defensive line. Uh, they have Derek White. They have, you know, Brady didn't have a great season. He didn't light up in the NFC Championship. Mm -hmm. he, was, he threw three interceptions, but the yeah. defense limited that to six points. I mean, this defense has the ability to make sure that, you know, they don't rely on Brady. I want the Patriots. The, the Buccaneers don't have to rely on Brady to do everything. Mm -hmm. They have the pieces around him to surround him with pieces to make sure that they can compete for years to come. I mean, it was the defense who shut down Patrick Mahomes. Oh yeah, it was the defense who shut down, uh, you know, the the Chiefs' running game. It was defense that made sure that uh, that Aaron Rodgers did not, you know, cap uh, capitalize on those three interceptions. So as long as you have that, I mean. I, I don't know when this guy's going to retire, and it's unnerving because every time he plays us, I'm like, oh, great, 23 again. I, I love I love seeing that again. So it, for me, as long as the Buccaneers continue with that with that, with that that defense, and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with Antonio Brown, but they, I mean, they still have some good receiving pieces. They still have a good running game. They're probably the most sound team in the NFC South, and, you yeah. know, with Brady still there, Brady doesn't need to be – Vintage 2011 or vintage, you know, 2016 Brady. He can be, you know, a Brady that only passes for maybe, you know, low 200 yards and maybe only one touchdown. But that's good enough for the Buccaneers to win at least 10 games. So as long as he's with that system, I don't see why he would need to retire. Yeah, and I like Bruce Arians as his coach, too. Uh, oh, Bruce yeah. Arians is always one of the best coaches in the league. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that's a good That'd one. Be interesting. Bring our two Manning back, be. yeah. <laughs> Saints need a god this season. Well, Taysom Hill or Jameis Winston, we'll see which one uh, fits the bill, or if either of them, or you know, yeah, <laughs> and. I guess that, and I know we're going to probably get to the Falcons, uh, looking at the Falcons in the NFC South. I honestly don't know. But like the Falcons, to me, could easily be the last place team. I mean, people keep on playing the Buccaneers, but like this defense still isn't in a position where I don't think they could really challenge for the division, let alone compete for a Super Bowl, which definitely not. The offense could put up, you know, 25 points, but they give up too many points to, uh, to really make that a reality. So, I guess my thing is that with the Falcons division, it to me, I'm wondering should I look at this year as more of a transition year than anything else? Uh, because it's going to be a lot of movie pieces. Uh, there's going to be a lot of new guys in the system. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if the Falcons were picking this high again. Uh, again, it's not an indictment on Matt Ryan. It's just an indictment on like wit, how this franchise has been led for the last five years, and mm -hmm. you know how Dan Quinn Dimitrov has left this team. And from my financial and from a on the field perspective, you know, people keep on saying that you may not pick this high again. I mean, like, have you been watching the Falcons? I mean, they can <laughs> easily pick this high again. Like, Matt Ryan could throw for 4,000 yards again and we could get four wins again. Like, yeah. it, unless he would not, it also would not matter. So, you know, people making jokes about Sam Darnold. Like, let's be honest, would it really be that hard for Sam Darnold to? like pass for over 250 yards on this defense. I don't think so. Um, so the Falcons could easily be a last place team, but given it is the Falcons and they have ability to win games, they have no business winning. They can easily be, and I forgot we have a 17 game season, so they yes, can easily do. be in the 
11, uh, maybe shock the world, go 11 and six or like, you know, or just, you know, win games. They probably should because their schedule is relatively easy. I mean, based on last year's schedule, they don't have that many gauntlet of games, which they did last year. So the Falcons so much have, have a wide gap of where they can go. To me, they could easily be a last place or they could just wind up winning division. And because 2016 came out of nowhere, they didn't make the playoffs for what four years prior to that mm-hmm. to that year, and somehow they won the division and went to the Super Bowl. So the Falcons are so unpredictable. I I don't know. They could be a last place team. They could win a division. Uh, but it, just on paper, I don't think they have what it takes to compete with the Buccaneers. And I still think they may, I still think they may circle with the Saints because again, they're our rivals, our biggest rivals, and they would like nothing more to you know you know crush our hopes again. Constantly, which they happen to do every year. Yeah. <laughs> How much will it hurt that they really only have seven home games? The Falcons do with the London uh, trip. That you, you know, the last London trip didn't end well. Yeah, I remember that game. I actually yeah. went to London yeah. for that game uh, when they played the Lions. Um, I, I think I remember that game well. Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, is the for the Falcons is in their last couple of years, they, they haven't played that outstanding at home in the first place. So like maybe in the minds of fans, it might mean a lot, but I don't think I'm being too much. I mean, the Falcons have been, especially in Dan Quinn's tenure, they have not been a very great home team. They're okay. They have a better record than down the road, but they've been okay. So I don't think it'd be that big of a difference. And especially since, uh, are they playing the Broncos on the, uh, in London this year? Uh, is that the team they're playing? I don't know if it's been announced. Yeah. Okay. But whoever they're playing, I mean, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a level for both teams. Both teams are playing in London. It's gonna be an early game for fans. So it's gonna be just for both teams. But overall, I don't think losing at home game will be too much of a difference maker since the Falcons over the last five, six years, I mean, have not played all the outstanding on at home. Had this been the old Georgia Dome days, days with Mike Smith, I would tell you, oh, yeah, that's a huge loss. But now it's kind of like, yeah, it might. Uh, but uh, you never know what you're going to get from this team. It's probably going to hurt them more the having to travel over, which yeah. the, other, the team they're going to play will travel over as well. But not every team they play in December will be going to London. The cumulative effect of that trip on the season. I would say it's probably the biggest impact. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, overall, concerned about this. Concerned about the defense. Uh, Matt Ryan. He's not. And when he's not declining as many as f- some fans will believe. But you know, you have two years with him with the restructure. So uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'm interested to see where where he, how he does. He had a but. He, up to his standards, I'm pretty sure he would tell you I didn't have a good season last year. I he had some great. really ugly games against the like Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't play that well against division opponents like the Saints game in New Orleans. He had an awful game. And, you know, as much as we talk about the defense and offensive line, I would be worried. I, I am still in the back of my mind, I'm worried that are we going to see maybe that decline that people talk about from Matt Ryan? I mean, you know, it's not out of the room possibility. Not not everyone is Tom Brady, who doesn't age, you know, we saw the Saints kick the can, kick the can down with Drew Brees, and it, it it didn't, and it didn't work. So it didn't get in that second ring. So I'm interested to see where, how he's going to perform. You know, do we get that 2018 Ryan, or do we get the Ryan from 20 from uh, this season, which he was fine, but you need more than fine to get this team to the playoffs. Yeah. I, I think not having the running game really kind of hurt Ryan last year, not being able, you know, and, and not having Julio Jones on the field for, for a lot of the season. So uh, I still think there's a lot lot left in the tank with Matt Ryan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, say, and I keep saying this, he's a Hall of Fame quarterback. I, he, he has a Hall of Fame career, and I still think there's more to be had with him. Um, there's not much more because, you know, I, I've studied it and normally when a quarterback turns 37, that's when they start dropping. That's when their 
uh, stats drop a little bit um, and where you start seeing maybe some faults open up in their game. Uh, and Ryan is 37. But I, I think, you know, you give him some good surrounding pieces and he's still a quality quarterback. Yeah, I guess my question would be to you, do you, but do you think he can repeat the same 2016 or 2018 numbers? I think that's less likely than a lot of people think. Um, I, I think Definitely that not 2016. And he's not he's not an MVP no. candidate. Yeah, not you're not gonna find that that tip of the tip of career Matt Ryan. Right. Um, but you, you're also looking at a quarterback who's seen everything on the field. Yeah. He's not gonna be fooled by any defensive coordinators. Normally with a young guy. Uh, defensive coordinators will catch up with, <clears throat> and then it's a matter of, you know, trying to adjust. Matt Ryan's seen it all. Uh, you, you're not going to fool. Him. So I, I think that makes up for quite a bit. I think that's one of the reasons why Brady is, you know, can can make his mark. You're just not going to fool him. You're, mm -hmm. you're not going to show him a defensive front switch out and then, you know, have Brady or have Ryan wondering what to do. <laughs> you know, they – they know where to go with the ball. They know where their receivers are going to be. They know, you know, how to counter different defensive looks. Yeah. So that's just, that's my take again, not hating on Matt, just it's father time and no, no one, except if you're Tom Brady can escape father time. We saw with Drew Brees, how right. much he weakened. So yeah, I, I don't think we'll see 2016. I think I, I, maybe we can see in 2018, Matt Ryan, who was electric too. Um, uh, yeah, so I think it's – I'm not sure what kind of career you gave Matt Ryan his two years, but I hope you get a solid career. Ryan has almost well, never hurt. That That is true. He's been one yeah. of the most uh, durable quarterbacks that, you know, has played. Um, one of the most durable has ever been at the position. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He just uh, – he, he's constantly – you know, he's out there taking the snap. He's, he's the guy. Yeah. Well, Julian, thanks so much for coming on. It was a very informative no hour. Uh, where can our listeners reach you and and listen to your stuff? So I, I write for Georgia State. Uh, the newsletter called The Signal. We cover a lot of Georgia State stuff, so especially the basketball team and the football program. Uh, you can also find me on uh, Georgia Sports Hospitality Media. I work with Mike uh, and other uh, great, uh, you know, great material on those guys out there, um, along with Falcons Nation. Uh, you can also find me on my YouTube channel called Cynical Beach. I talk about a lot about Georgia sports. Um, my next video is going to be of the worst losses in Georgia sports history. Uh, so <laughs> look out, look out for that. Um, and I also like to talk about players who fell off their career. So if you want to see a follow BJ Upton or follow Dan Ugla, uh, that's more my niche. I like talking about players who fell off on their careers, especially they played for an Atlanta team. And I'll probably talk about either the fall of Andrew Jones or fall of Jeff Fred Core who fans know really well. Right. Cool. Yeah, I'll definitely want to check those out. Our listeners Absolutely. should as well. Julian, thanks so much for coming on. That does it for this episode of NFL Jocks and Pigskins. We'll be back next Saturday, 12 a.m., uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time. All right. Thanks again, yep. guys. Thank you. Have a great week.